Hello everyone. We will wait just a little bit of time just to everyone to enter and join us. So thank you everyone for joining us. I would like to welcome you in the CVP 35 Years of Action uh, webinar. Uh, today we are going to talk about the right of return for Palestinians. Let's just talk a little bit about uh, CVP team. Christian Peacemaker Team is a faith-based organization which works through building partnership and to transform to transform violence and oppression. And we have different uh, programs and work uh, in different locations. We have uh, a Rock Garden Sand team in Colombia and Lesbos. We have also in US Mexico uh, in border and Turtle Island and finally Palestine. Uh, it's Tertil Al Junaidi from Palestine team and it's the oldest program uh, from CVP. Um, it was created in 1995, and we worked through supporting a Palestinian-led nonviolence grassroots resistance uh, through accompanying uh, our partner and educating people uh, about the Palestinian cause and what is going on in the ground. And now we have my teammate, Abdullah, uh, who will tell us more about uh, and update us a little bit about what's happening on the ground in Palestine. To you, Abdullah. Thank you, Tartil. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today in this webinar. My name is Abdullah Maraka. I'm from Hebron, Palestine, and I work with CBT Palestine team. So a quick update about what's uh, happening nowadays in Palestine. Uh, of course, maybe everyone is familiar with what's going on in the Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem, Al Sheikh Jarrah, and the Palestinians' family who's facing threats of being kicked out from their homes, not only in Sheikh Jarrah, also in a Palestinian neighborhood called Silwan. And actually three days from today, uh, there is a court uh, decision from the Israeli court about displacing three between three to five Palestinian families from their homes. Also in a Palestinian village in the northern side of the West Bank on southeast Naples, today there was a huge demonstration uh, because of an Israeli settlement that was created in the beginning of May on one of the mountains surrounding that Palestinian city. So today we will talk in general about the right to return for the Palestinian refugees, which is a really important uh, issue for Palestinians. And it started back in 1948 when the Israeli country was established after creating a war against the Palestinians living in the land. Today we will host uh, two Palestinians. Uh, first of all, we will listen to our guests, Lubna Shomali, from Badil organization, which is the Resources Center for Palestinian Residency and Refugee Rights, who will tell us more about the legal aspect of the right to return concept. Then we will listen to our second host, Mr. Bilal from the Danish House in Palestine, who is personally a Palestinian refugee born in Lebanon, and he'd been living all his life in Denmark, and he had many chances to come to Palestine during different years. At the end, we will have around 20 minutes for Q&A. So I suggest all of you, if you have any question, to write it directly on the Q&A, and we will give time for answering those questions. 
Um, now we move to our guest, Lubna from Vadil. Lubna, um, I will give it to you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, hello, good evening. Good morning. My name is Lubna Shomali, and I'm from Vadil Resource Center for Palestinian Residency and Refugee Rights. We are a human rights organization based in Palestine. Now, I do have a, um, a slideshow to show you, so I'm going to be sharing that now. Um, as I recognize the city, the important all time. Um, human rights violations and crimes have ramifications. Uh, they have ramifications not victims, but also on states. They stay uphold international law, ensure that human rights violations, particularly those that are systemic and systematic. And if they are not prevented, then there has to be a system in place, a checks and balances system for states uh, in order to adhere to international law. So in order for this process to go through, um, it's very important that we um, as individuals and uh, states, politicians and political parties describe this situation or apply the right um, diagnosis to the situation in Palestine in order to have those uh, ramifications come through. One of the main terms, one of the main terminologies that Badil has been known for and has introduced into the international discourse is the ongoing Nekba. The ongoing Nekba is a situation in, in, uh, in Badil's, even though it's not a legal terminology, but it's a situation that aptly describes the situation in Palestine. The ongoing Nakba doesn't just refer to what happened in Palestine in 1948, but rather refers to the ongoing displacement and dispossession that the Palestinian people have been exposed to since prior to 1948 and has continued on to, dis on to today. Um, this displacement and dispossession uh, is coupled with the denial of the right of return. The importance of the right of return stems not just from the fact that it exists in international law, not just in the main treaties and conventions like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but for the Palestinian situation, it exists both as an individual and co collective right for the Palestinian people. Um, so it's very important in, uh, it's very important and Israel recognized this and so not only did Israel continue to displace and dispossess Palestinians, but another compo important component of that displacement is the continued denial of return. And this is what Badil is referring to when we talk about the ongoing Nakba. So as I said, ongoing displacement and dispossession coupled with the denial of return has, has had significant impact on Palestine. And it began prior to 1948, the Nakba or catastrophe. Uh, as early as 1917, when Palestine was occupied by the British and the, the formation of the British Mandate for Palestine, during that period, approximately 150,000 150, Palestinians found themselves displaced outside of mandatory Palestine, either by force or by um, British laws that denationalized Palestinians. Then in 1948, we saw the largest wave of displacement, or in other words, it was the period in which the greatest number of Palestinian refugees and internally displaced persons were created. During that time, about 750,000 Palestinians were displaced outside of what came to be called Israel. Another 40 to 60,000 were displaced internally inside what came to be called Israel. Then in 1960, when Israel occupied the rest of Palestine, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Gaza Strip, we saw another 500,000 Palestinians displaced, some of them for a second time, because they were displaced originally in 1948 or during the conflict in 1948. And today we continue to see displacement. So what's going on in Silwan and what's going on in Sheikh Jarrah is a symptom 
or a result of this, uh, these policies that Israel has put in place in order to continue this displacement and dispossession. Israel has also put laws and policies in place to deny return. And these two components of Israel's strategy are used to achieve one goal, and that is the control of the maximum amount of land in Palestine with the minimum number of Palestinians. Um, <clears throat> Since Badil is a human rights organization, and we were created in 1998, by the way, um, and the date is significant because it's five years after Oslo. Um, Badil was created by the refugee community itself, Palestinians inside mandatory Palestine on both sides of the Green Line, as well as Palestinians in the Shatat or the diaspora, calling for an organization that would work to promote and defend their rights according to international law. And so this is what Badil has attempted to do through its different programs, its research and its advocacy as a human rights organization. We don't limit our, our analysis or our diagnosis of what's happening in Palestine just on international humanitarian law or the law of war and conflict. We also use international human rights law uh, international refugee law, as well as international criminal law. And so we have formed this legal analysis based on many frameworks of international law, including um, colonization, the framework for colonization, as well as the framework for apartheid. And according to all these frameworks, um, it's very important that we're all on the same page in terms of uh, the terminology, as I said. And so when we look at how uh, displacement and dispossession or transfer happens uh, and the results of it, we talk about um, forcibly displaced persons. And there are two types of forcibly displaced persons according to international law, refugees and internally displaced persons or IDPs. Refugees are individuals who are forcibly displaced and have crossed an internationally recognized border. So Palestinians that were displaced out of mandatory Palestine or Palestinians that were displaced out of what came to be called Israel and entered into the West Bank, the Gaza Strip or the surrounding countries, those individuals are referred to as refugees by international law. The same is true of Syrians fleeing Syria. If they leave the Syrian borders, then they are refugees. Same for Afghanis or Yemenis. Um, if they are fleeing and uh, if they are forcibly displaced and cross a border into another entity, then they are considered refugees. Internally displaced persons are individuals who have been displaced but remain inside the entity or do not cross an internationally recognized border. So Palestinians that, for example, that were displaced from Haifa to Yaffa, from Yaffa to the Naqab, um, from Yaffa to Jerusalem, these are individuals that are in, displaced inside the entity and have not crossed an internationally recognized border. Now, regardless of whether you are a refugee or an IDP, you have the same rights under international law. And we can say that there are basically two buckets or two areas of rights. One is the right to live in dignity during the period of your displacement in which your basic needs or your basic rights need to be met such as access to housing, adequate standard of living, um, freedom of movement, freedom of worship, residency, uh, access to health care, access to natural resources and services, access to education, et cetera, et cetera. The other bucket of rights revolves around the right to reparations. And for refugees and internally displaced persons, reparations is a four component package. Reparations include voluntary physical repatriation or return in layman's terms, uh, property restitution, the return of the property loss, not just the movable property, but also the, the immovable property. So this would incorporate land um, as well as homes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, compensation for damages, if damages have been done to the property or to the individual. So we're talking about psychological damage or the loss of dignity. Um, and then finally, guarantees of non-repetition. Uh, changing the circumstances or the situation 
that created the displacement in the first place. So these would be the Israeli policies that induce the displacement. In order to understand displacement uh, or a forced displacement and transfer, we have to understand what international law recognizes as force. What does what does what constitutes force according to international law? Well, there are two types of force. One is what we call traditional force or um, the normative type of force which is the force that is derived from armed and violent conflict. What we saw in 1948, what we saw in 1967, what happened during the wars on Gaza, what's, ha what's happened in Syria, what's going on in Yemen, World War I, World War II, the Gulf Wars, et cetera, et cetera. Violent physical removal of people from their places of origin and habitual residence. And this is the easiest type of force to see. It's the most recognized uh, type of force. The other type of force uh, or most visible, let's say, not necessarily recognized because both types of force are recognized under international law. The other type of force is what international law calls the creation of a coercive environment. In layman's terms, the creation of a coercive environment is the creation of a situation that is so unbearable that an individual really has no choice but to leave his place of origin or habitual residence or the removal of will, um, the will to be able to stay in a certain area. And the coercive environment is caused by the denial of one or more of your fundamental rights. So the rights I spoke to earlier that allow you to live in dignity, such as freedom of movement, worship, access to health care and education, um, access to water, um, adequate housing, adequate standard of living, residency, et cetera, et cetera, um, access the right to land. All of these things all are considered your basic or fundamental rights. When these are violated, a situation is created that doesn't leave you any choice but to leave. While there is no physical force applied, there is a coercive environment at work that forces you to leave your place of origin or habitual residence. Now, the international community did create a protection framework for Palestinian refugees, particularly after the Nakba, after the um, after the largest wave of Palestinian displacement that occurred in the years from night from the years from when the British mandate um, when the British left Palestine so about 1947-1948 uh, through to about uh, 1949 in the 1950. Um, and there were two agencies created in order to fulfill these rights that forcibly displaced persons are entitled to under international law. The right to live in dignity during the period of their displacement and their right to reparations or we're just going to go with return, their right to return. And so the UN created UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, um, and UNRWA was tasked with providing humanitarian aid and assistance so that Palestinian refugees could live in dignity during the period of their displacement. And so UNRWA in the initial phases of the Nakba were providing things like blankets, tents, clothing, medicine, um, uh, food, water, et cetera, et cetera. As the, refuge, the Palestinian refugee situation became more protracted, UNRWA became a service delivery organization. And the main services they provide are healthcare, ed education, and um, social services to the most marginalized refugee families and groups. UNRWA operates in the five main areas in which Palestinian refugees uh, reside. And that is the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. Unfortunately, this is limiting. Uh, this geographic scope is limiting because we know that Palestinian refugees are being displaced out of their traditional host areas, such as Syria during the Syrian crisis. Palestinian refugees fled Syria the same way their Syrian counterparts fled, and they went to areas in which UNRWA didn't operate. So there was a complication there um, a structural deficiency in UNRWA's mandate that didn't allow them to provide services to Palestinian refugees outside uh, their areas of operation. 
There are many other structural deficiencies within UNRWA, but that could be a discussion for another day. The other agency that was created and was actually created before UNRWA, UNRWA was created in 1950. The UNCCP was created in 1948 with UN Resolution 194. UN Resolution 194 is the main UN resolution that speaks specifically to the return of Palestinian refugees and IDPs. And so the UNCCP, the United Nations Conciliation Commission on Palestine, was created in order to facilitate, coordinate, and implement the right of return of Palestinian refugees and IDPs. And so with these two agencies, they were created with the intention to provide Palestinian refugees with the international protection that they are due or entitled to under international law. I already explained some of the issues with UNRWA, the fact that they have a geographic limitation. They have other limitations as well. And one of them is that they don't have a steady um, flow of income or a steady flow of funds from the UN in order to be able to provide the core services to Palestinian refugees. And if you've been following UNRWA in the news lately, you know that in 2018, the United States decided to defund UNRWA during um, the Trump administration. Um, and so there are many issues that UNRWA faces that prevent it from doing um, its mandate, uh, from, from performing its mandate properly. The UNCCP became a defunct organization in the late 1950s, early 1960s. The United States is one of the, one of the countries this, that sits on the committee of the UNCCP. And the UNCCP was regulated to a, a symbolic organization or a non-functional organization. The one thing that they do every year is they submit a report to the UN on the progress that has been made with regards to their mandates. And each year they submit a report that says no progress has been made because no progress has been made. To this day, not one single Palestinian refugee or IDP has been able to exercise his or her right of return. And this is because of Israel's adamant denial of the right of return for Palestinian refugees and the policies that they have put in place in order to um, prevent the return. Now, what does this mean on the ground? What it means for us, protection, the lack of action by the international community means that the Palestinian refugee population is the largest and most protracted refugee population in the world. We are talking about 8.7 million people in total between refugees and internally displaced persons. And these are numbers are consistent up to 2018. Um, each year, Badil produces a, um, a publication called the Survey of Palestinian Refugees and IDPs. And we try to provide the most updated information on uh, Palestinian refugees and IDPs, including uh, statistics and their um, um, demographic composition, where they are, um, what their situation is, um, what kind of things they're suffering from in terms of, for example, dis discrimination against them in Lebanon or the situation in Syria, how that has impacted them and so on and so forth. Um, let's take a minute and think about that number though, 8.7 million people and counting because displacement is ongoing and so is the denial of return. Um, we are talking about 66% of the Palestinian population, almost two thirds or two thirds of the Palestinian population. That means that out of every 10 Palestinians you meet, seven of them will have experienced displacement at least once in their lifetime, while a significant number has experienced displacement more than once. And we do have situation in which Palestinians are both refugees and internally displaced persons. So let's take an example. Palestinian refugees in the Gaza Strip. Uh, about 80 to 85 percent of the population in the Gaza Strip are Palestinian refugees and their descendants from 1948. Now during the first and second and third war on Gaza and even during the recent um, uh, military assault 
on Gaza uh, in, in the last month. Um, these same Palestinians and their descendants were displaced internally due to the armed conflict and the violence that occurred uh, during those wars. So they had the potential to become internally displaced inside the Gaza Strip because they can't leave, they can't get out of that entity or cross those borders in Gaza because of the blockade. So they had the potential to become internally displaced four times over. So we do have that situation in which there is secondary and tertiary and multiple um, uh, situations of, of, of displacement. Another example would be Palestinian refugees in Syria. Many of them attempted to uh, leave Syria similar to their Syrian counterparts, where they were turned away at borders or were not able to make it to other host countries. The vast majority of them, however, became internally displaced inside Syria. So what we have, a, 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 when we talk about the Palestinian refugee situation, we're, talking, we're not talking about a local situation that is isolated to Palestine, to mandatory Palestine nor are we talking about a situation that is isolated to the Arab region. Rather, we are talking about an international situation because Palestinian refugees today and their descendants reside in almost every continent on the planet. And this is a situation that has resulted from one, as I said, Israel's strategy to control the maximum amount of land in Palestine with the minimum number of Palestinians. By using, uh, by using displacement and transfer and also denying Palestinians the right of return. It is also caused by the lack of action of the international community to address the Israeli human rights violations and crimes. We talked about the coercive environment and the situation in which Israel is violating Palestinian basic human rights, the, light, the right to live in peace and dignity the right to live if in free from oppression, uh, the right to residency, the right to land, the right to water, the right to education, and so on and so forth. But there are also international crimes happening. When we talk about forcible transfer and displacement, we are talking about an international crime. When we talk about colonization, we are talking about an international crime. When we talk about apartheid, we are also talking about an international crime. These um, the perpetration of these crimes by Israel should trigger a reaction by the international community to hold Israel accountable. Unfortunately, the situation that we live in today is where the international community is reluctant to hold Israel accountable. And the most we see from the international community, from the European Union, from the UN, uh, from the United States, from the major uh, Western countries, are condemnations of Israel's human rights violations and crimes without any practical actions to hold Israel accountable. And so with this immunity granted to Israel by the international community, we will continue to see displacement and dispossession and denial of return. And this is exemplified, of course, by the situation in Silwan and, and Sheikh Jarrah, because it's just a repeat of the same, an ongoing Nakba uh, for Palestinians. And I'll stop there. I haven't seen um, Bilal. Uh, are we still waiting for him? Or do you need me to continue? Or I'm not sure. No, no, uh, Bilal is here and he's waiting also his turn to join okay, us. Great, great. So, I mean, you could have signaled me. Sometimes I keep going when I, when I shouldn't. <laughs> so I'll no, stop actually, the share. You are, you are I'll hand it back over to you. Mission. Thank you so much, Lubna, for this amazing effort that you do in Badil and amazing information that you've been sharing with us. Uh, just a quick reminder for everyone who's joining us, uh, you can send us any question in the Q&A chat box, and we will give time at the end, after we listen to our second host, Mr. Bilal, for uh, 20 minutes, we will have Q&A session. And if we didn't manage to answer all the questions, we will answer it to you and send it to you via email. Now, Bilal, it will be great to have you here. If you can just share, us, share with us your experience as a Palestinian refugee who was born in Lebanon, then your family moved to Denmark, and then you managed to come back for many times to Palestine, either to work or 
to visit the country. So the mic with you, with you, Bilal. Thank you, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is, is the sound fine? Yes, yes. Thank you, and uh, thanks to Lubna for a um, very interesting uh, lecture. It was uh, really interesting to uh, listen to that and we could hear about that for maybe four hours. It was very, very interesting, thank you. Uh, first of all, my name is Bilal. Uh, I am Palestinian, born in Lebanon in uh, a refugee camp uh, called Shatila Refugee Camp in Lebanon in 1987. And in um, 1992, we, uh, I moved to Denmark. Uh, we fled to Denmark because of the civil war that was taking place in Lebanon. Um, we, we actually fled uh, and uh, got a refuge in Denmark. And uh, actually I have been raised in Denmark for almost all my life. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I have been going to Danish schools, had uh, education in Denmark as well. And um, at that time during my childhood, um, my, um, like my, my, my uh, it, how do you say it? Um, yeah, my, uh, my comparison or my knowledge about Palestine have been very uh, limited to what my grandfathers, uh, grandparents told me about because um, we, my family, they fled from Palestine in 1948 from a village called Al Khalsa. It's in uh, North Palestine, uh, in historic Palestine today called Israel. And um, they fled to Lebanon. My parents, they are born, born in the 60s and uh, they're actually also born as refugees in Lebanon. Um, so the stories that I knew about Palestine was through the stories from the eyes of my grandparents about stories that took place and happened before 1948. Um, yeah, and uh, during my study, I studied international business communication and Arabic, and I had uh, one year abroad where I studied in Cairo, in Egypt. And uh, suddenly in, um, in the university where I studied, I had a study mate, uh, he was Norwegian, called Ulau. And uh, he actually uh, was the one who has exposed me, uh, who was the one who exposed me more to Palestine. Um, he uh, used to live in a, in a village called Yanun and working with EAPPI. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Yanun is a little village uh, very close to Nablus and Akraba. Um, and he told me about the stories and I was very interested to hear about his experiences there because the only thing that I knew about Palestine was the stories from my grandparents and um, the, the news uh, during the, first, uh, the second Intifada, especially. Um, but suddenly it was in 2010, uh, my friend uh, Ulau, he told me that he was going to Palestine and he asked me if I wanted to join him. And I was like actually very surprised about it uh, and um, was a bit worried about if I actually could be able to get back. He told me, yes, you have a Danish passport. You should be able to go back and, uh, and visit uh, your country and I will go with you. And uh, we said, well, he started to prepare me about uh, what would happen in the border, uh, at the border, the questions and everything. He told me that it would be easier for him because he is a white European, white Scandinavian, and it will be a little bit more difficult for me. But we don't have anything to lose, so let's try. So actually we went there, we were stopped for several hours and questions. And uh, we, we managed to get back to um, access uh, to go to Palestine. And um, our first night was in Jerusalem. I'm very sorry, I have a parrot at home. I'm so sorry. Uh, actually, actually, my first uh, two seconds, please. <laughs> yeah, actually, my first uh, visit, uh, yeah, we, we, we visited Yanun and stayed by a local family there. And uh, this was actually my first exposure to uh, 
the pictures that I from my grandparents was the pictures of Palestine that was where people were uh, living in peace and uh, like before the Nakba and uh, how beautiful the land was and um, and uh, Um, it seems like the internet has a couple of issues in Bilal. We have a couple of questions for uh, Lubna, so we can start with that till we get Bilal back. Um, so Lubna, we have a question that says, why does the international community not speak out more against Israeli war crimes? And what do you think is uh, at the roots of this? Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, Bilal. Sorry, I fell off. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but um, yeah, what I said is that uh, I actually got uh, the chance to, to <laughs> I actually got the chance to uh, live in Palestine in 2013, but the permit that I got from the Israeli authorities, they could, the permit that I got from the Israeli authorities was actually a tourist visa for only three months. And I had to leave the country each, every three months, even though that I was living and working there. Um, and uh, during my stay, I actually also wanted to uh, visit my, uh, my own village where my grandparents have been living in uh, Al Khalsa. And uh, I managed to go there and I knew from my family and from my, my grandfather who told me that the mosque should still be there. Um, the city was, the village have, have been ethnically cleansed in 1948, totally. No Palestinians are living there. It's only Israelis who are living there. But uh, I went, managed to go there, see it, explore it. It was like very um, uh, emotional trip. It was my first time there. And uh, when I got back to uh, my home in Ramallah, I called actually my grandfather who was living in Lebanon. Um, he has been living there like since he, wa he, wa he was expelled from Palestine in 1948 when he was 18. Today he is about 90 years old. But I told him, granddad, I have been there. I have, uh, I have, I have been there. I saw the mosque, I saw the village. And he, then he began to describe everything that, uh, and ask me so many questions. There are many of these questions that I couldn't answer because I didn't actually see it because the village was not the same as it was before. It was actually an Israeli city. Um, but th something that uh, was um, um, very important for him is that he asked me about a river that is going through the, that is passing through the, city center and very close to the mosque. It's called uh, in Arabic, Ayn uh, al-Dahab, the, the gold river, they call it. And he told me that it was like, for him, the, uh, the, re the, the symbol of life. It was actually from this river that they used to live, to drink, to, um, to water their fields as well. Um, and uh, for him, it was, uh, like very important. And then he asked me something very important. He told me like, when you are at the mosque, there was a little bridge over the river, right? I told him, yes, I have seen it. And then he, asked, he said to me, okay, when you cross the river, you will see the graveyard, the cemetery where our family and the people from our village uh, have been buried. And his grandparents have been buried there as well. But I, can't, I couldn't remember it. It was like very strange for him to say. I felt that it was very strange, but I couldn't remember it at all. I told him, okay, I will go there back again and I will try to check it out. 
uh, two weeks after, I was thinking very much about it because I couldn't see it. Two weeks after I went there alone, I rented a car and went there alone. And I actually tried to go in the same place where he, what he, like as the same uh, track that he described to me, I passed the little bridge, but in front of me, uh, there were no graveyard, no cemetery. Uh, it was actually made into a, a park where uh, there, there were like a, a place where people could uh, uh, work out and people could go there and picnic. And uh, for me, it was actually very disturbing to experience that because I knew what, uh, what was under this, uh, like uh, this land uh, in this field. Um, I went back to Ramallah, but uh, actually I didn't uh, call him and get back to him and answer him about what happened to the graveyard because I knew that it would be something that will be very sad to tell him. And especially because he has been out of Palestine for 72 years now, and uh, he has never had a chance to go back to his own village, even though that he is actually living in Beirut, in Lebanon. It's like 300, 200 kilometers away from his own village. And he is living still in Shatila in the refugee camp. Um, but this was something that uh, like, um, th that also gave me uh, like a lot of, like a lot uh, to, my, uh, to my own identity. Because personally during my childhood, we used, I don't have any family in Palestine. We used to live uh, I have been living in Lebanon and in Denmark, so we used to travel to Lebanon. And when I was like, while I was living, and I am living in Denmark, uh, even though that I have a Danish passport, but um, we are not being as a Palestinians. We are not being portrayed as Danes in Denmark. They portray us as, as Danish Palestinians if they are friendly with us, or they portray us as uh, refugees or. Um, guest workers or something like uh, terms like that. And when I remember when I was going to Lebanon to visit my own family, they called me Dane. So uh, I, I didn't have any balance in my identity. And it was not only personal for me, but I could feel it also uh, from my friends who were like born here in Denmark in my own age and living here for 30 years. They have actually the same experience about it. Um, but uh, for me, the trip to Palestine to be li living there, to live there, and um, um, and experience my own country and explore it, all the cities in the West Bank, in the Forty Eight, even I went to the Golan Heights. Um, it was uh, something very special to me, and even though that I didn't have any family, uh, I got like friendships like that. Uh, I will never. Uh, compare to anything else. Um, I had families that uh, actually took me in uh, to to them as the, as I was their own son, and um, the Palestinians and the Arabs who are with us here, they know what it means when you can go when you go into a family and you go to Um Ali and open and go to the kitchen and ask her like, "What are you cooking today?" Um, I really felt at home at that time. Um, but back, back to my village, I just have a last thing. Um, I went to my village several times, maybe once each month, just to be there and uh, to try to explore more and more because I wanted to know more. And my grandfather, when I was visit, visiting him in Lebanon, I also made him to, like, uh, he also told me more and more stories and details not only about Al Khalsa, but also because he uh, actually lived in Haifa, in Haifa for four years, and he was working there. So uh, when I showed him the pictures of Haifa and described to him, and he could actually also describe the places, the neighborhoods in Haifa, uh, the port uh, where, like just before 1948, where the Jews were living, where the Palestinians were living, where the Christians were living, uh, it was. Um, very interesting to hear up like and he had like he have uh, thank god a very very strong memory but when i once i wanted to go back to my village and i was talking to him and on phone i was in ramallah and i told him that i'm going back to my village in next week 
and he asked me for something very, very special that was very meaningful to him. And um, I thought maybe he wanted a little stone from Al Khalsa or some, some like anything, maybe a little flower or anything. But he told me, no, I want uh, water from Ain al Dahab, from this river. Um, I felt like it was okay, this uh, I can, maybe I can do it. But uh, for him, it was very, very important that he wanted this water. I actually managed to get this water to him. And uh, I have a little video that is that I want to uh, show to you um, where I go back on a mission to my own village, where you can also see my own village. It's just for a few minutes, and then I will get back to you. I don't think there's any sound. Um, can you hear it now? Thank uh -huh. 
The last thing that I wanted to say is that um, I actually got the bottle to my grandfather a few months after, and it managed to go to Lebanon. And for him, I like when I was talking to him, it was very meaningful. Like, um, even though it's just water, you know, it's uh, but for him, it was a symbol. Uh, but it is not a national symbol, it's a personal symbol. It's not Handala, it's not Al Kufiya, it's not uh, these national symbols that we have. But for him, he have this is something that is connected to his uh, own memory, and uh, something that is uh, very meaningful to him. It was actually this water. So um, uh, I like my point is the identity. It can be developed in for each Palestinian uh, according to each uh, memory that you you have. And uh, my story is not something that is uh, special or uh, something that is unique because it's actually the, basically the story of each Palestinian refugee who have uh, been living outside uh, or who have been expelled in 1948 or 1967. Um, and it's actually the story of millions of Palestinians. Uh, this is all what I have. Uh, thank you for listening. And I'm very sorry for, yeah, the sound that I had. Thank you, Bilal. That was really emotional. Thank you for sharing your experience with us. Um, now we move to the Q and A. Um, so the first question we have one question for Lubna that says, uh, "Why does the international community not speak out more against Israeli war crimes? And what do you think is uh, at the roots of this?" Um, th the reason they don't speak out as much is because there are significant relations between Israel and most um, powerful Western countries. I mean, we know that the relationship between Israel and the United States is very uh, significant. Uh, they have numerous trade agreements, diplomatic agreements, strategic agreements, and so on and so forth. The same can be said between Israel and the EU. Um, so these types of relationships, uh, financial, military, uh, diplomatic, um, the United, uh, most Western countries view Israel as a strategic partner in the Middle East, a civilized Western country, uh, democratic uh, country in the middle of um, the Arab region. And so they are uh, keen on maintaining those relationships. And this is why the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is so important. Um, these relationships, of course, are um, results in significant um, uh, partnerships, business partnerships, and private partnerships between uh, Israel and their um, international counterparts in these Western countries. And so this is why it's important that we um, uh, move forward on the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement and um, encourage people to not only boycott Israeli products, but also divest from Israeli companies um, so that we can create a situation in which that tide will turn um, or it will, it will no longer be profitable to be aligned with Israel in that way. The same that, uh, situation that occurred in uh, former apartheid South Africa and their boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement.
Okay, thank you, Lubna. I hope this is answered the question uh, for the person who wrote it. Now we have another question also for you, Lubna. And it says, uh, have you seen any a change in response to the Palestinian struggle since the last Gaza war? Um, the international solidarity movement abroad has been very supportive of Palestinians, but unfortunately the support is sporadic and it coincides with an increase in the structural violence that Palestinians experience. So each time there was a war on Gaza, there was um, uh, the inter uh, international solidarity movement would rally and there would be protests and demonstrations and so on and so forth. Once that would settle down, the um, actions by the international solidarity movement would also um, unfortunately settle down. And we also saw it in the situation, this most recent situation um, uh, with, the, with Silwan and uh, Sheikh Jarrah, um, and, and now it has also died down. Um, so while there, while there has been a great amount of support from the international solidarity movement, there hasn't been enough momentum and pressure created to push governments to do something more practical about the situation in Palestine. Uh, and this is what needs to happen so that we can see more um, effective measures rather than just condemnations of Israeli violations and international crimes. So I guess the answer is yes and no, um, but I do think that the cumulative effect or, or there, there is an increase in awareness, um, uh, particularly among the international public uh, concerning the situation in Palestine. And this of, of course is, is to our advantage and um, we will be seeing the repercussions of that um, in the future, I believe. Thank you, Lamina. Uh, we have our final question for today, and we can open it for you, Bilal and uh, Lamina, uh, which says that what about the claim of population transfer between Palestinians and the Jews from Arab countries? Well, um, uh, those claims of displacement by Jews from Arab countries need to be taken up with those countries from which they were displaced. The same for Palestinians who were displaced by Israel. Those Jews have rights. If they were forcibly displaced from those countries, then they need to, um, uh, then those countries need to be held accountable for that displacement. And those Jews that were forcibly displaced from those countries are owed reparations in the same way that Palestinians are owed reparations from, uh, from Israel. Uh, Palestinians were not responsible for that displacement, and so therefore we should not be held accountable to it. But those countries that forced those um, Jewish populations out do. Now, on that note, there was a significant recruitment efforts by Israel for those Jews so that they could come to Palestine and acquire Israeli citizenship and nationality. So in, in most of those cases, they weren't necessarily forcibly displaced. I'm not saying there was no displacement by those Arab countries. I'm sure that there was. But I'm saying that also there was a movement by Israel in order to change the demographic composition of Palestine. They fabricated the demographic composition by displacing Palestinians out and replacing them with with the Jews from around the world. And one of the ways they did this is that they recruited Jewish populations from other countries to come to, is, to, come to Palestine. Um, and so that was part of it as well. But in the same way Jews were owed reparations from World War II and the Holocaust, Palestinians are owed reparations from Israel uh, because of the Nakba and because everything that's happened since after the Nakba as well. Yes, and if I may, I totally agree with uh, Ms. Lubna about uh, what she says. And I just want to add a note also, like it's nothing about, like it's not about 1948, but it's something that happened like in the recent years. Uh, when we saw the attack uh, in France um, against Charlie Hebdo, we have seen like, uh, we have seen uh, the prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu going there and actually, when the attack was on, on the, was on the Jews, he actually urged 
and invited the French Jews to actually move, uh, get Israeli citizenship and immigrate to Israel. And um, this was actually, and this was actually also a part of the recruitment and to strengthen uh, to strengthen the immigration to Israel. And this is also a way to claim that uh, it's Israel who are representing uh, the Judaism in the world or the Jews in the world. I'd also like like to point out that in that situation, the individuals, the Jewish individuals, the family that were killed um, during that, that attack were actually shipped to Israel and buried there. Whereas Bilal's father, Allah Ya'ati Tultul Umar, but if he dies in Lebanon, then he's not going to be brought to Palestine to be buried. That family who has never set foot inside Israel, inside Palestine, had the privilege of being buried there, whereas Bilal's father, who was buried there, who was born, I'm sorry, who was born there and was forced away, he will not have that opportunity or that, it's not an opportunity for him, it's his, his right, it's his entitlement to return to Palestine. Uh, and hopefully it will happen when he is alive and not, uh, not when he is dead. Inshallah. <laughs> Thank you, Lubnan Bilal. Um, so I would like to thank you all for your questions and Bilal Lubna for your time uh, being here with us. Um, now, um, this session will be recorded. It's, it is recorded and we can send it to you. And you can also find it after the webinar um, and the CBT, um, CBT website. Thank you, and thanks to uh, the team of CBT for organizing an event like this. I think uh, the question about the right of return is is have like is getting more and more important right now, especially now where we have seen the recent events uh, and also the uprising that we have seen in um, the 1948 Palestinians. So uh, thank you all for organizing this fruitful meeting. Ditto. Same here. Thank you, CPT. And thanks everyone for watching and listening. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I would like to remind you that um, thank you for all the support. And you can also follow our social media and the CPT website and sign up for our uh, mailing list. Um, we also put the links for the deal and uh, you can check Bilal's video if the internet was not really well, so you can Check it there. Um, I would like to take this moment to uh, and take this space to, take, to ask people to take action um, against the Hebron Fund, which is a based the charity organization in, in New York. This organization sponsored the settlers activities in Hebron. And we asked people to stand in real solidarity with us to put pressure on the Attorney General of New York, Lydia James, to investigate the charitable status of the Hebron Fund, which is the main settler organization in Hebron. And you can find the link uh, also in the chat box. So please find uh, the petition, sign it, and share it with your friends and community. Um, and also, like, you were very important part of our work and the sustainability part uh, of our work. Uh, so uh, you can donate also for CBT to help us grow and to help our work uh, keep going. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amira, for putting the link. Thank you. Thanks for our guests. And thanks for everyone for your time. Thank you.